This program is brought to you by Dolku Media. Fixing South Sudan, ideas for the new nation. With award-winning journalist Mading Mor. Absolutely. Honorable Ashwin, as you can see, the ideas of the initiatives are varied. The July uh, on July 8th, uh, the clashes in J1 took place, which was very unfortunate. Including uh, country-specific ones, uh, which uh, the rebellion continues. Fixing Ideas for the new nation. Hello and welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor. This week on Fixing South Sudan, a critical look at how South Sudan can transition from war to peace. What will it take the society to build a culture of peace to ensure a harmonious and prosperous South Sudan? Joining us in the program, Bishop Dr. Isaiah Majung Dao, Overseer Sudan Pentecostal Church. We are honored to have him on Fixing South Sudan for the first time. Welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you? Thank you, Madam. I'm all right. Thank you. When we talk about transitioning from war to peace, building a culture of peace, that is very ambitious. Yes, it is ambitious but there is no alternative for it. Because if we want to transit from where we are now as a nation, war of more than 60 years, I usually say anybody who is under 60 like myself, anybody born under 1955 is a child of war. So we have grown up with the war, we have gone to school in the war, we have married in the war, we have born children in the war, and we have known nothing but the war. But now, we have an opportunity, finally, to change that. If we talk about the culture of peace or cultivating it, it means that, as you have just pointed that out, we have known otherwise. So, what is South Sudan as it stands? What kind of culture do we have? And what is the culture of war for that matter? The, the culture of war is that we... Let me give you an illustration from my own life that as a child, in the 50s, when I first opened my eyes, I saw military wires all over the South. So my toys were actually guns. There were military tanks. That's what I knew. But as I have grown up and become a priest and become a bishop, through that, I know that we need to change something. And we need to model peace. You have heard people talk about putting the interests of the nation above our own. And that means that we will accept peace and we will work for peace and we will do our best in our communities to make sure that peace is the culture just as war has been the culture for the last 60 years or so. Why don't we tackle this practically? How do we do that? How do we uh, inculcate that culture in our people? I want to share with you the program from the South Sudan Council of Churches, Action Plan for Peace which talks about first changing the narrative of peace through advocacy. That we need to bring to our people that war doesn't benefit anyone, whether you are winning it or you are a victim. So we advocate that we change that mentality. But secondly, by providing forum for those who have grievances to talk about them, to air them, and we'll be able to listen to them and address them. But thirdly also, by by uh, working for peace and forgiveness among our people. That we need to forgive what has gone, we will not bring it back. Mr. Mandela, I studied, I happened to study in South Africa. When he went to prison in 1964, he was saying, one bullet, one settler. When he came out in 91, he was saying, we are the rainbow nation. He led in that regard by modeling peace and reconciliation and forgiveness among his people. He went in as a different person, mm -hmm. came out as a different person. Mm -hmm. And what was the effect of that on the society? The effect of that is that we have a harmonious society in South Africa. It has other problems, 
but the problem is not that one settler, one bullet. It has other social problems like any other. But they have come to agree that we are all equal before the law, we are all equal before uh, a nation called South Sudan. There is no one who is a second class citizen. We are all people of the same nation. And that has come through very well when he modeled it even by, by stepping <coughs> down. Uh, when his time finished and gave, giving room to others. Okay, let's flesh out your action plan. It has three pillars, neutral forum, peace and reconciliation, advocacy. What hmm. are they? Advocacy, as I said, is to change the narrative, change the thinking, the way people are thinking, the way they are doing their thing. Because we now in South Sudan, we know if you have a grievance, in most cases you settle it through the guns. We want to change that. If you have something that you think is not right, you don't have to fight. You just have to talk. A neutral forum is that we provide a space for those who cannot, for example, those in the opposition, those who cannot come to Juba. We call them to come. We have been to places to America, we have been to, to, to Europe to change the diaspora. The, the, they use social media to incite people here. And we try to change that by providing a neutral forum for them that there are better ways to channel it. Peace, I mean forgiveness and reconciliation will be a process. It's not a one day thing. Uh, whether we talk in communities, uh, let's take the example of Jongle, for example, the cattle raiding. You will tell people to reconcile, but you must have to have an alternative for cattle raiding. You will not just tell them to stop it. What do they do after that? And I think uh, the process of reconciliation must include compassion of some sort and, uh, and services to the people so that they have better life alternative rather than just cattle raiding, which is dangerous and, 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 and devastating at the same time. For so it will take more than words for the society to change? I think so. It involves change in the attitude. Change of attitudes, change of actions, and then it will zero into behaviors. Let me co contrast your plan with uh, the UN General Assembly program of action, which is similar, uh, mm -hmm. on a culture of peace. Mm -hmm. And they talk about eight areas. Mm -hmm. Fostering a culture of peace through education, promoting sustainable economic and social development, promoting respect for all human rights, ensuring equality between women, and men, fostering democratic participation, advancing understanding, tolerance, and solidarity, supporting participatory communication and the free flow of information and knowledge, and lastly, promoting international peace and security. Is many things, and there are practical aspects of it. Mm. So in our context, what do we have to do more than what you are doing? You are preaching the message of peace, and as it is evidence, that is just not adding up. I think uh, uh, that, that is the comprehensive plan, in my view, uh, for, for a peaceful society. And for us here, there are many things that we will have to change. One, is we need to change the mentality of dependency, where people depend on their people, others, to, to, to thrive and to live. But also we need to, cut, to, to, to encourage the culture of work. You know, even if schools are open and the children are not able to work hard, they will not change anything. The same if peace comes and we don't go back to work, that will mean we just quarrel over the government resources where the government is only the employer. And the rest of the people depend on government rather than the private sector. So there will be a diversification of the economy, diversification of the rich resources that we have, because South Sudan is actually a very rich country. Talk about fisheries, talk about uh, uh, wildlife, talk about agricultural land, they are very rich, but they are not being exploited. Take for example, who digs our pill latrine in, in Juba or in South Sudan? It is foreigners. Why can't we not do that? Uh, one of the, in my view, one of the positive aspects that the, the maybe the war has imposed upon us is the fact that when things became difficult, the <coughs> citizens themselves are now, for the first time, learning to do things for themselves. They are very resilient. I, I have nothing about uh, against uh, our people in the region. I, I lived and worked in Kenya for many years. Uh, I know about Uganda. I have nothing against them. But the, the people 
basically local people need to take responsibility. The point you're making is that uh, the role of governance is critical mm -hmm. for us to be able to achieve these ideas that we're talking about. And good governance like that. Good governance. That good governance is crucial. There's leadership. And I, I need to say that leadership is not just positions. Uh, and because for us leadership is positions, that's why we quarrel over positions. You can, you can like now, Madingo leading this program, you are a leader. You are influencing society. You don't have to, to fight with somebody to do this program. You are using your talents and God-given gifts that you have. That, that's what we need to cultivate as we create the culture of peace. Because why are we fighting in the first place? People may talk about many things, but the bottom line is it is about resources. It is about power. Don't you feel that there is a huge gap between the ideal and the practical? Where we want to go is far away from where we are. And how do we bridge that? First, we need to be realistic. We need to know that we are not where we used to be and we have not yet reached where we are going. And that will mean that uh, being true to ourselves and being able to, to, to really, in small ways, bring impact, even beginning from the local. I, I live in Shirikat. When I first went to Shirikat, they, they told me you will be killed because I was the last person. But that now I am in the middle. I keep goods. They have been stolen. Most of them have been stolen. I, I, I grow some maize. My neighbors will not pay attention when we are cultivating, but when we are harvesting, they all want a piece. So, so I decided to bring seeds. But I want to give to my neighbors seeds and say, you plant seeds. It may be a small garden, but if everybody was to do their small thing, you change something in the attitude of people. And that's what transformation is about. And you talk about leading by example. And in this case, that is what you try to do. That's what I'm trying to do. But what can we project to the people of South Sudan, they are in their millions? How do we turn around from where we are going? Begin where you are. Begin with the little thing that you do and you do very well. Do it consistently. One of my mottos is aim higher, begin small, and then grow bigger. If you begin with your little garden and you are consistent in that, you can expand the same with time. But you have to begin somewhere, somehow. Especially leaders. Leaders should not be talkers. They should actually be doers. They should lead the way by what they do, not by what they say. Because what we say is important. But if we don't do what we say, we have serious issues. That's a good place to mm. take a break. Thank you. Welcome to Dorco Media Services. We have so many services for you, such as video production, camera hiring, sound system hiring, event management, passport photo, stand-up comedy, printing, drama, music, dance, multimedia, and photography. Dorco Media Services, our culture, our pride. Welcome back to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor, and with us is Bishop Dr. Isaiah Mujungdao, Overseer Sudan Pentecostal Church. We talk about how to transition South Sudan from a culture of war to a culture of peace. When we talk about changing attitudes, we are talking about people. And if people are accustomed to certain ways, often very difficult to make a U-turn. So. And as they say, it's difficult to teach an old dog new tricks. So mm. what are we talking about here? First, uh, you will also excuse me for dealing with leaders, because I'm also a leader. I know people need to be led. And they need to be led in such a way that we show them example of what we do as we live day by day. So I'm saying we are going to transform South Sudan from that culture of war to that of peace, leaders themselves will have to take the leading role. 
by their example of forgiveness, by their example of compassion, their example of love, their example of even condescending sometimes, stepping down so that the interests of others are guaranteed. I, I gave you the example of Mr. Mandela. What he did, because I was in South Africa in 1995, when he, when he, when he, when he stepped down, he set the stage for others to follow. You know, apartheid was very cruel and it's created in South African violence. But Mr. Mandela changed that by his own example. Not, not of course, every one of us can, cannot be a Mandela, but we can try in our own small ways, especially we are leaders. When I talk about leaders, I'm not talking about politicians alone. I'm talking about business people, I'm talking about professors in the university, I'm talking about teachers, I'm talking about business leaders who should model transformation by the way they live and by the way they conduct themselves and by so doing they can change attitudes. How about we look at it from a different perspective? Education, very important. In other countries, peace education is embedded in the curriculum. So why don't we say the old ones are a, are a dead cause? There's no way we are going to be able to change them. Mm. And an elder once said that his generation has been part of the destruction. And mm. he asked a rhetorical question. Do you think we can be part of the construction? Mm. So why don't we focus on the young? Good message, too late for others, but can we apply it at an age where in the long run it will make a lot of difference? Yes, yes, we can. But it will take practice, it will take consistency, it will take example. They say most of the things that the young generation learns are not taught, they are caught. So uh, I, I, I contest the fact that the old dogs cannot be, ca cannot be taught new tricks. <laughs> because for one thing, if the old dogs really is in trouble, for example, you used to give it food on the plate and they are really hungry and they are desperate. You, you put food on the ground, they will eat. You have taught them new tricks. So that we need to change that mentality. Well, let's talk about your example as a, a leader in your own right. Hmm. And are you teaching them new tricks? Yes, I try in my own ways. Like now, my term is supposed to be 10 years. When 10 years come, whether I'm still qualified or I'm disqualified, I won't, don't want to stay on. And currently I'm preparing new young, young leaders without telling them that I'm preparing you. Because if you tell them you are preparing them, you are already planting a seed. Maybe something will happen, they will not be, but you can show them by giving them roles and opportunities, and talking to them and mentoring them. So, so I believe I have been a teacher as well. I've been teaching at the university for 21 years. I try to, to model, I try to, to show an example of what it is to be a leader, especially transformative leader in the lives of others. Somebody will say it is because you are a pastor, but, but I'm also a human being and I live in a community. Uh, and I, I need to, I face the issues and challenges that everybody faces every day. But I learn by the grace of God through those and be able to, to influence others. Does the message about uh, cultivating a culture of peace discount the role of rule and order in the society? Yes, it does. But you know, the thing is, you should, I've been in Addis, as you know, uh, from 2014 uh, with, with the church team. Usually we think about the peace that we will bring from Addis, but we don't actually begin the peace that we can have with your neighbor who is next to you there. What are you doing there to keep good neighborliness with that person? So it doesn't have to be big steps. It has to be small, important specs, uh, steps that we take every day towards making peace and harmony. Being deliberate in wanting to forgive. Being deliberate in not living in bitterness. I usually give an example that if you mading or you make me angry and I take a poison, half a liter of a poison, you are not the one who will die. I am the one who will die, the one who is taking the poison. Mm -hmm. So as leaders, we need to model those forgiveness that we can forgive you. Yeah, we struggle with forgiveness, it is true. 
Anybody who is telling you that forgiveness is easy, they are lying. It is hard. But then, for your own sake, and for your own the, the, the peace within you, you have to make that. Because it is better for everyone that we live in harmony among ourselves. If you know the origins of South Sudan, it's a liberated country. We had a difficult past getting here. People have to die, and in their millions, for mm. us to be where we are. Mm. In our messed up situation, it certainly will take more than peace mm. for South Sudan to be a country, given the level of lawlessness we are seeing in the country, and the, the, the rule of order, uh, the rule of law has to be strengthened, and often it's unpleasant. It also requires death penalty at times, mm. and is that what you encourage? Law and order together with a bit I, of compassion. I do think that you are making a very, very important point, that peace is not just about stopping the violence. It is also about rectifying the past. I may not call it in the language of the judiciary that it is, uh, it is uh, punitive in that sense, because purity has its own place. But it will take more. I, I, I usually say that even if the guns were to be silenced today, and we South Sudan will say, ah, now peace has come. We will, we will make the mistake that we made from 2005 to 2011 when we said referendum, referendum, and freedom. We didn't talk about the South Sudan we want. We didn't talk about how we will govern ourselves. We had a common enemy, that common enemy is gone. And guess what, if you don't have a common enemy, you will find an enemy among yourselves. So I do believe if the guns were to be silenced today, we in the church, we do think that that's when the peace process really begins in earnest. That when we have to go down to communities, and we are already doing that, by the way, in what is called community conversations. I have been all over South Sudan with others from the South Sudan Council of Churches to go to those communities and say, please talk among them. So, because you know, as I do, Madi, that people at the moment, even people who did not quarrel before over little stupid things, they are doing that now. Things like the name of places. It should be called this, it should have not been called that because of the county has come or the boma has come. People will kill, gun themselves down. So really the problem is not there at the top. The problem is also the grassroots, where we have, are traumatized and we are fighting over silly things that we should not fight over. And so if the guns stop today between the warring parties, the, the endless work has to begin in communities. You know, as I do, there are communities even within one clan that are fighting over things that they should not be fighting over, killing one another. What do you make of the fact that despite uh, the fact that South Sudan is majority Christian nation and also a religious society. We also have Muslims and yet still the culture of violence mm -hmm. is pronounced. What encourages it? That is a star question as far as I'm concerned. Not that other questions were not. Because why is it that we say we, the majority are Christians and we are still tribalistic? We are still violent. We are still full of hatred. Why? Among many other things, when the gospel has not penetrated the value level in our hearts, we remain the same even if we go to church every day. Take most of our leaders who are fighting, they are consistent Christians, attend church every day. But what, what, what is going on? There are other values that are bigger than the value of the gospel that transform people. We have not allowed those. Because when things are hard, we go back into our tribal cocoons. Because that's, that's what we know. It is like if you are drowning and there is a log of wood, you hold on to it for dear life. But if a steamship comes along, you, you will have to let go of that because you have a better alternative. The gospel has not penetrated the feeling level, the value level. And will probably not do that. I, uh, I believe it can't. With consistent uh, practice of the same and modeling of the same. Does it have a timeline? 
because some of these people have been Christians. It, it is a lifetime are. process. <laughs> it is a lifetime process. It cannot have a timeline. As long as we are living in this world, we will need to change every day. When we talk about fixing sorcery, mm. what does it mean to you? It means, first it means to me that South Sudan is not, is not what, what it is now is not what it's supposed to be. There is something better. I always say there is something that is, the best is yet to come. That's one of my mottos, the best is yet to come for this country. So when we fix South Sudan, we want to put South Sudan in its place in the community of nation. A nation that has been blessed by God in many ways. Rich resources. Great people. Our people, even when they are fighting, like when we were in Addis, they fight in the hall. When they come out, they greet one another. The, 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 the mediators were confused. They say, why, why? You were trying to kill one another on the table. Now you are, you are even greeting one another. We are a great people. And that potential has been overshadowed by power struggle, by greed, we need to change that. The South Sudanese will occupy their place in the community of nations. So now, later there will be peace. There will be a culture of peace. Mm -hmm. South Sudan will be harmonious, prosperous. Is that right? I believe that with all of my heart. If I didn't believe it, I would not be working for peace every day. Can we, you give us a prayer so that we close off our program? Thank you very much. Lord God, we thank you that you are able to transform this country, this great country that is even mentioned in the scriptures in Isaiah 18. We pray, O oh God, that you will bless our Sudan with lasting peace and with a culture of peace. Bless this program. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And thanks, Bishop, for being in the show. Thank right. you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Madi.